Hello and welcome back to playerpredict.com. I'm delighted to be joined by today's the famous face in my neck of the woods, and it was in Galway GEA. You mentioned strength and conditioning in Galway, or even in Hurland for any matter of that word, you will straight away, I think nine people out of 10 will, will, will say Lucas Kirkenstein straight away. He is, of course, head of athletic development in Galway Hurland. He has his CV looking earlier on. It's Irish teams, it's all Ireland's multiple, it's so many sporting teams. So delighted to, uh, to get uh, Lucas on board today. And we want to try and pick his brains about his fascinating journey because it is a fascinating journey. He seems to say that every week, but this one is, is extra special. So firstly, Lucas, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to try and start off straight away. We kind of strip back to our, our childhood and our early sporting, I suppose, influences or people that kind of gear, gear your sporting career or your, your kind of loves or stuff like that. I, I always give the example. It's my early sporting memories. My mother bringing me out to the garden and dragging me out and making me play football. And, and then from there on, I got hooked. And now we like every sport under, under the sun. But so obviously you, you didn't grow up in Ireland, so you didn't have the GA straight away. Who were your early um, sporting influences? are you know idols that you would have liked yeah it's it's a great question believe it or not i kind of grew up kind of pretty average there was actually no big sport exposure in my life early and um, now what i probably uh, where maybe what i'm fortunate was really that i had a multiple exposure to different sports so i went through you know your standard kind of a soccer and um, a bit of a track and field um, that's essentially what it was really and I was really fortunate to have a good PE teacher you know she was really good and now I'm looking back at those things she took us through stuff and um, that's initially I was kind of thinking like why are we doing those things what are we doing dance for example um, um, she exposed us to the gym early like a you know as a teenager I was able to kind of sample that so you know in, in the child development in, in, the, in the young athlete development the sampling is very very important uh, stage you know you have that sampling and I was fortunate to sample many many things never seriously um, and then I probably narrowed down when I went to university which was probably a little bit too late as well I narrowed down to martial arts and then martial arts was my sport to be honest I was never really good at it but that's why that's where the passion came for improving the physical stakes because I was probably never gifted as an athlete and um, I was fast enough actually um, compared to average so maybe that's why I was running hundreds and maybe uh, 200s uh, in the high school um, but again it was it was a level that you you know you don't really mention those things um, but again the variety of different stimulus was probably good and um, for me and then passion came at some stage just before I really went and it's my um, e my sports science um, degree um, towards kind of improving those things. And when I actually was doing kickboxing, you always kind of thinking, okay, how can you actually get better um, at physical stakes? Because you know, in martial arts, this is yourself and the opponent in the ring and physical preparation is kind of important. Why? There's no way to hide, like in team sports, you could have an off day, the rest of the team will drag you along. And in martial arts, there's no such a thing. You become live boxing bag if you're not uh, prepared. So that's essentially what it was. It kind of made me thinking. Um, yeah, so that's what it was. Like, no spectacular sporting career, believe it or not. It was just more the, the whole spectrum, the bigger picture, and I suppose a variety of different environments as well. And, like, we were fortunate enough in, in uni to be exposed to different active activities as well. So I could get that idea. Like, I was training in the morning for kickboxing. Then I was going to uni. We could have track and field. We could have gymnastics have swimming and we could have all all different things and then in the evening I was doing my technical or, or tactical or my sparrings and like I was literally going on um, Monday to Friday two to three times a day so I got that idea in terms of how it actually is to manage that training and um, then a bit of a gym came along and you know that kind of a personal training bit that added another layer into the understanding of things and then slowly start putting things together and then when I, when I came to Ireland, uh, believe it or not, it was actually um, hard to break into industry for me. Um, it, it was a case of finding or meeting the right people in the right time. So the person that you probably know, he's from Galway. He was a person that um, initially allowed me to break through into strength conditioning, and that's Des Ryan. Des Ryan is a head of athletic development in, in Arsenal. 
So there's kind of, I was doing an RFU certification course, a CCC course, and then I was looking for experience. I was training teams already of my own accord, doing a bit of a course and training, which, which is a nice foundation uh, in terms of a one-to-one -one approach, which you still need in large group settings. Um, and then this kind of got me um, in contact um, in Monster Academy and just went from there. Um, so, it, you know, nothing spectacular in terms of my sporting experiences. It's just the variety, I suppose, was a strength for me because I seen many different sports and I trained many different sports, but more recreationally or anything like that. But then eventually, just because I was probably average as an athlete, I was looking for that extra bit of edge um, when I was doing kickboxing and those things made me thinking how to how to get better preparation and how to get edge over people. Yeah, it's actually a very interesting point as well. And I think it's become more and more prevalent. I think I don't like to discriminate against sports, but I think one sport in particular as fuel is, and I think that's professional football, soccer, whatever your variation of the word, in the fact that it's become such a, a global empire, it's become such a multimillionaire business really so kids if they're any good at all are being you know being lured into academies from quite young you see young kids i think liverpool even signed a six-year-old there recently as well but kids very very young in their in their early kind of life never mind sporting life are being yeah. honed in straight away to perfect one sport and they don't get that variation as you described there i think i think from a personal point of view i've no, no education there but just from looking back at a distance i think it's important as you said to to get a different variation try different very sports maybe then at the end of your early teens you can kind of focus towards one sport but you're i'd be interested to hear your thoughts your professional thoughts on, on that sort of mindset it can, the, the variation that you described how important is that for high level athletes as well massive like <laughs> it like we, I think we get uh, what you said with early specialization is wrong. I don't, I don't really like it. Now, in certain environments, it's kind of, it, it almost the way it is, as you said, in professional soccer, like that's the way the academies work. But academies actually, the good academies, they will probably get those kids in and they will do multi-sport, multi-activity with them. So they will provide that stuff for them. But I think like up to 12 years, you should be playing, playing, it should be all play. It shouldn't be anything structured or such. And you should be exposed to as many things as possible. I'm trying to get my son signed up now. He's four. Um, I'm trying to get him signed up to gymnastics. Because I believe gymnastics is such a beautiful tool to develop that body awareness. I don't want him to be a gymnast. Oh, well, if, if he wants to be a gymnast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, let, I let him at it, but I definitely want to have exposure to that. I'd love to have exposure to track and field when you take body through positions through some rhythmical drills um, and allows you to get those better running positions and clean running. And again, team sports are important too. Obviously, you know, and w working with a team environment, you know, getting along with peers and, and, you know, just even playing different sports, different coordination skills. Dance is important too. If you look at the, at the um, Irish dance, like it's, it's a beautiful activity to have a good and develop good reactivity in the foot, the ankle stiffness, which essentially makes you nice and fast in, 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 when the ground is hard. So those things are, are important. I think the early um, specialization, maybe we're talking about, we start narrowing down maybe from 13 years up, something like that. And again, you know, there's, there's nothing set in stone, but I'll definitely invest a lot of times at the bottom of pyramid it will be. Play as many sports as you like, or just play, enjoy it, definitely don't get bogged down to tactics and structures and stuff like that and maybe then when you have that road development at that base maybe from your 15 16 years of age just try to invest time and then narrow down and make sure that you have picked your sport and then really go for that one but that that you know those years should really give you a um, good good foundation um, athletic foundation um, and the other thing is, kids will probably enjoy it more. And from, from even from injury standpoint, I think there's a paper out there that tells you that the more activities you can sample early, the more robust athletes you're going to be in the future. Again, nothing is set in stone because you really depends on many, many factors in terms of injuries. Um, but definitely my view on those things is just being exposed to many different activities, you know, uh, play around in the gym, gymnastics, dancing, track and field. You know, play play basketball, play Gaelic, play hurling. They're, they're just fantastic activities, and they really teach you and they demand from you different skills, um, coordination, spatial awareness, and body sensation, where segments are in space, and 
obviously different athletic qualities too. So that's my view on those things. You know, it's very generic, but you get an idea. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose if we focus on your, I suppose your career, your career, the story I've been told, and I have a feeling there's a little bit of urban myth told, is is that you came over to to Ireland for a kickboxing competition and never returned. I'm sure there's a little bit more to it than, <laughs> than that. I think that's kind of got sampled down. But your whole kind of, I suppose, transition transition into Ireland, uh, that story about it, how did that come to light? No, that, that is not true. I, I, I'm feeling that's a little bit, uh, there's a lot of chapters of the story left <laughs> out. <laughs> you didn't have to decide, oh, I like this, I'm, I'm not going home, cancel my return ticket. <laughs> I never heard that story. Actually, it's funny. Uh, as I said, uh, to put things into perspective, I was I was never super kickboxer myself. I enjoyed it, um, and I retired due to a shoulder injury, um, and I miss it. To be honest, I I miss I miss that part because training is very enjoyable, and getting kicked in the head or kicking people in the head is enjoyable. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, way to get rid of stress. I, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's great. Um, and I missed that kind of a toughness in training as well. And it was a great way to keep fit as well. Like, I, you know, I was, I was in, in good nick um, training um, kickboxing. I could, I could run distances really fast. My body fat was low and all those things. To, you know, and I actually never had a really any serious injuries outside of one or two broken bones, which happened. Um, but I came to Ireland straight after doing my, uh, my degree and I finishing my master's. That was my plan, really. I didn't really want to. Um, I could work as a PE teacher in Poland or maybe do something within the university, but I actually didn't really want to do that. I just want to go and travel. Went to London first. Didn't really enjoy London that much. And my brother was here in Ireland. So I came over here and was fortunate enough to get a job pretty quickly in the gym. So just started off as a gym instructor um, and then just slowly worked my way through it, personal training, and started getting contacts, picking up different teams, like the soccer team here, some athlete here, some golfer there. So um, so martial art is here, and I just was working again. Something that I was one and always passionate about was just developing people physically. Um, and then as I said it came back to a situation that I really want to get into strength conditioning. And funny enough, actually, um, someone told me, um, I was a couple of years in Ireland already, and I've been told that I'll never get into strength conditioning in Ireland. Really? Yeah. Is that because of your um, nationality? Was it? Uh, it was picked yeah, up. Yeah, nationality, people? and it, and it. It's it's literally um, now it's very very competitive industry because you know there's so many coaches out there and jobs are so few. Um, but at that time, it was made nationality and in GA for example everything was literally it was very um, closed environment as such very hard to get into it. And and that was true at that time. But again, it was a case of it always is like in 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 professions is where you can and meet the right people at the right time, and they can um, reference you to some people that make decisions, and, uh, and that's what happened with me. Now, obviously, I, I, I work hard to, to showcase myself to those people so they can invite me to their uh, training environment, but that, that was the story, basically. What were your first impressions of, of, I suppose, the GEA when you got here in terms of hurling and, and Gaelic football? Would you have even known about them in, in Poland before you arrived over? No, no, we don't know those sports. We don't know Gaelic. We don't know uh, hurling. So, like, if you ask people in Poland about it, there's no understanding of that. I know some of part of the population now of Poles that went back to Poland. Um, there's, there's large numbers of people that came in here, but now they're, they're back home. So some of their kids grew up obviously, and they went to school, and they were exposed to hurling and those things. So I think there's a club or two in Poland in terms of a GA oh, club. Very interesting. Whether it's still going on or not, I don't know. Um, but the sport, obviously, Gaelic maybe, but hurling isn't really accessible to us unless you start from, you know, New Young, because it's, it's just such a difficult sport in terms of uh, skill and coordination, hand-eye coordination and those things. I practice hurling myself for the last uh, three years. How I can strike the ball, but lads still taking piss out of me. Uh, <laughs> you know. You, you won't be having a, a, a sneaky call to Shane after training or anything like that, will you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic game. It's very, very enjoyable. Even poking around is very enjoyable. Um, and I actually love the sport. I, I used to be kind of a follower for soccer, um, boxing, MMA. But it's, it's been dominated by GA now and hurling in particular. Absolutely love the sport and, and live games and those things. So, uh, yeah, fell in love. 
uh, with hurling, really. Yeah, well, I think the old cliche is that what the fastest sport uh, game in the world. Um, we like to, I think, we're probably guilty of over overselling at times because we're so we're so proud of, of our national sports, Parliament in particular. But uh, it is, I know, even myself, um, family in America and US when they come over to visit and they're like, bring them to the game, and they're like, what the hell is <laughs> is going on here? Even yeah. uh, some friends over from the UK uh, for the weekend bring them into Crow Park for. Uh, for a game or two when they're like Jesus how is there not a load of rest or something like that it's uh, it's certainly um, a sport a, a sport that kind of you know captures you straight away because it's it's yeah. intensity is it so much as well did did you have to like your your first sports in when you kind of came in was it kind of rugby I know you said you kind of experimented with various different sports your your rugby was probably one that you kind of I suppose your skills get transitioned easier straight away across to it or was it, or was it easier to get into well, that, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. As a, as a SNC coach or a strength conditioning coach, you can work with any sports. You don't really have to be, um, you know, like you, do, you need to have understanding in terms of what are the demanding of the sports. And that's the first thing you do. like. So I could work with any sport. What I have to do, I just need to sit down and read about sports. What are the requirements? What are the demands? What are the physical demands? Positioning uh, requirements maybe injuries, and if you break down sport like that, you have to do a bit of work, you just have to do a bit of study. That's why it's nice um, to actually change sport sometimes because you get, you get just pigeonholed into one, and as a, as a practitioner, it probably limits you a little bit, so it, it's nice to change the sport from, from time to time because you just need to study um, the requirement of, of other sports. And uh, So yeah, I remember when I was in TIP actually, so there were obviously Polish guy. I just landed there by accident, in, because I was brought in as an assistant by um, Fergal O'Callaghan at that time. And Fergal couldn't really continue on with the role. So he just basically abandoned the, the ship and I just stayed on my own. <laughs> there you go. Very traditional yeah. county. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with the passionate coaches around. So, you know, first of all, you need to deliver your program. You need to look after strength conditioning. But Eamon O'Shea at that time was the manager. And he's a very passionate guy. So, you, you know... Communication is one of the skills you have to have as well when you're working in sports. So it was a case of, yeah, well, what I know about strength conditioning is one, but how can I actually deliver it to the team and how I can, I can uh, seamlessly fit in with the, with the manager as well. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a fast and steep learning curve in first year in TIP. And again, people outside were obviously kind of saying like, who, who is he? Like, <laughs> what does he know about like? Harlan? Exactly. So, um, and they were right, essentially. Um, but again, from prescription of the program, it's it's you know you just follow certain steps like you break it down, you learn about sport the demands. Again, it's just the culture and environmental factors are important. So maybe that's where the people when they were slating me like, what is the Polish dude doing in, in a really traditional county? And maybe from that point of view, they were right because essentially things are the same, but you deliver them different environment to environment it's different in rugby it's different in soccer and it's different in in ga yeah so you're i suppose if we try and kind of step through your career that i would know you more, more personally of it i think it came really to light where i became aware of you was your role in the rfu and women winning the women six nations they must have been very very special times to be involved with such a successful team like that as well yeah, it was it, it was very very special for me. I remember at the sideline we were actually we were playing England one of the matches in the Six Nations and we bet England eleven eight. Um, and England that time they were training professionally in terms of a physical preparation and it was a really special moment for me. You know, Polish bloke here with uh, with Irish girl and winning the Six Nations <laughs> match. We won Six Nations in 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 Scotland. I was involved with those girls before that as a regional coach and then I I. I stepped up to a national coach role. Um, it was a challenging role because it was based in Dublin and I was living in Limerick. So it was a case I had to deliver the gym session to the Dublin-based girls and oversee the other regions then. So 4, 4 a.m. I was in the car. Wow. 6 a.m. Yeah. And then from, um, from 6 a.m. session delivered, then I was going to RFU to Lansdowne Road, the office just do my bits there. And then I was jumping in the car and was going tip training. Um, so it was hard going for that year, but again, everything in life is a lesson, and you know, um, definitely wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, I was a little bit younger, and it was challenging, but it's a valuable lesson, and I was exposed to very good people in RFU as well, um, in terms of you know how you manage your surroundings and 
and training as well. My boss was pretty strict and harsh at that at times, but at the same time, um, very valuable lesson to learn in, in that environment. That must have been, I'm even getting tired thinking about that day, if it's a 4 a.m. start and then tip training in the evening. Did you get to sleep at all? Yeah, I, I slept. <laughs> I slept uh, in patches, I should say. <laughs> Obviously, tip don't train every night. Um, I haven't haven't been in Dublin every day either, so you could kind of manage it that way. It was hard going, but it, it was worth it. Girls, are, girls, there were exceptional as well. They were a fantastic bunch, um, very committed, very experienced as well, and um, loads of them were very established too. So it was a pleasure. And um, and again, training female athlete adds that extra bit of a facet to understanding because. Essentially, you do the same things again, but you deliver them slightly different. So, yeah, and it was a special time winning that Six Nations. Remember in Scotland, we were we we had to beat Scotland on the points difference, and I think we had to beat Scotland by thirty points, and um, and we bet them I think sixty nine three or something like that in Scotland. We won the Six Nations. Yeah, it was very special, great experience. Yeah, well, it's a great start to your personal CV as well as in, and then your your tip days were, were so successful as well. But I think you touched on it a little bit there. Obviously, the GA, I think we're guilty of, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier as well, of being kind of close-knit because it's our identity. Um, you, it's pretty much passed down generation to generation. And it's it's mm. such a, such a like particularly I'm from rural, rural Galway as well, where it's, well, it's it's football, our, our side of the, in the county, but it is the Gaelic football and pretty much nothing else. That's your bread and butter. There's there's no other social distractions bar mm-hmm. pub and stuff, but in terms of sport and that is it. And it's it's literally part of your DNA. And then that's kind of grown up and passed down the generation. So I think we are very, there's a little bit of a closed circle in terms of our, our, our sport, but for you then trying to break into it, <clears throat> excuse me, and in such a traditional county as well where you know hurling is absolutely you know people live and die for it in, in Tipperary as well how was as a Polish guy coming in I know you've been settling a while how was that was there any difficult challenges or you're like would you ever think at one stage what in the name of God have I got involved with here or any any kind of uh, aspects of that story you want to diverge yeah there were challenges in the, the environment itself Players were only just getting into certain kind of routines and, and framework, maybe. Um, and the, the way things are delivered in rugby, like I, I got a chunk of my experience in Munster Academy. And, you know, that's as close to professional setup as possible. And now you're landing in, into uh, kind of GAA. And at that time, in 2012, things were a little bit different. There was no kind of established patterns, routines and those things. So it was a case of working those string, um, working out through those things, and and educating players and making sure players will buy into stuff. And I'm I'm not going to say it wasn't easy. And we'll, look, you know, I had good days in tip. I had bad. We had bad days too. Um, I, there's no hiding from that. Um, but everything is a process. Like it's it's hard to jump into new culture and and change everything within the month or two. Um, so it took it took a couple of seasons, and we built up to something that we have our own kind of way of doing things and then eventually it just paid off and um, i think boys just took it even further from, from from that point and just continue on improving that culture improving that environment in terms of making that performance environment that essentially what you have at every county now i believe you know before actually in 2012 or prior to that if you had a good kind of environment in terms of a training managing training and those things you had an edge these days I think the counties, most from what I talk to coaches, is we're doing similar things. Uh, so that edge is probably gone a little bit. I think more important is um, to have a look at now investing in the grassroots and inventing young athletes because that essentially will make sure that these fellas arrive to senior team in better conditions and then you can step up level higher. So the, the focus should change now to the bottom of the pyramid and maybe helping club educate clubs and, and getting better understanding to clubs in terms of uh, physical preparation and build up. Get, essentially, players are coming from the clubs. Um, so that that's probably the next step to address and just kind of have a good understanding with the, within the club coaches how certain things can impact performance, physical performance, and what the development should look like. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and of course, no no more mm-hmm. further than your, your Six Nations success you did or were played a big part in in temporary winning Lee McCarthy. How again, 
as a as a, a kind of a I suppose a, a, an outside culture. I think we we kind of use that term a good bit in GA, but coming in like a different nationality as well. I know you're kind of well settled, but how how could you describe to somebody? Back home, St. Poland, then no idea that what kind of hurling is and the spirit of the GA win and Lee McCarthy, like the emotion that was involved in that win as well. They must be again another special environment to be to be involved in, another brilliant experience as well. I'd imagine. Yeah, in '16, the homecoming was very, very special. Um, I thought it was just. I still have a. I recorded a video on my phone. I still have it. Um, and if I go, um, I, I used to work with company, I kind of put that on hold a little bit, but I used to work with company delivering courses in Poland. Um, and I always say like my background where I work with, and so I always show little clips from hurling. It was just like, yes, like <laughs> what the hell is that? What the hell is that? And they, they ask questions like, they see the crowds in Croke Park and they, they can't believe that uh, players don't get paid. I said, no, they do a pro bono completely, it's nothing. And they just they just love the sport, and I suppose that's the beautiful thing about GA is just the passion of those players, like how how much they love and, and the coaches as well. Um, so that's very unique, and I think we need to support that. Um, so going back to um, the special moment, yeah, it's just that homecoming. I every time I watch that video, I still have shivers. Like <laughs> it was, the stadium was completely packed out. You kind of go left and right. It was just huge. Obviously, the goalie one was very good too. It went by and slow. And then in the stadium, it was just split into two different camps. But uh, these are special moments. And uh, it's great to see the players, like how much of the relief and enjoyment is there when they, when they make through the line. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted for players because I know how hard it's, it's, it's win. Uh, it is to win. And how much they have to put on the line. You know, they just have to really go to a strict, strict regime these days. Just to put everything upside down towards their preparation. And essentially, they all try very, very hard and they all try to win. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out really. So sport, like, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I suppose, we, I don't want to go too far into it, but just in a general term, if we can at all, it seems to be more, now more than ever, we're having these constant debates. Should GA players become professional? They're, you know, they're pro processing so much of their own time in involved in strength and conditioning, in recovery and rehab and getting training. It's, it's almost become a full-time career. Um, but then the other side of that is it's going to dilute. We've seen it with soccer and football and a couple of other sports where it can dilute that passion, that description of the homecoming that you described as well. And that loved yeah. As you probably can give a different aspect to that, you, I suppose, question and that answer in, in terms of you know just getting the body right and the benefits will be that way. But seeing a little bit of both sides, what's your own opinion on what if you were in charge? What way would you go? Is semi pro the way to go, or should we try and leave things the way they are? I think you should leave you should leave things the way they are because as you said it you'll kill the passion you'll kill that spirit of, of GEA and I think that's really really unique and you will you'll just destroy it if you just go towards elite you'll destroy it but what definitely what you can do you can invest into a framework or the support structures for these players in terms of like your, your nutrition your physio support your 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 lifestyle coaching your performance coaching and mentoring those things so give basically holistic um, uh, support for these players um, and when they're with clubs or with, with county it doesn't really matter they shouldn't really have access to those things 24-7 the way I work with players I always tell them look I'm always here for you there's um, you know I reply in messages whether it's January or December it doesn't really matter and you know in the middle of club championship they still ask me questions and I think we should have a structure for them set 24-7 when they do um, looking for um, ideas or they need to have um, something addressed in terms of injury front or they just need to basically some advice in terms of a career or something like that. That's something we definitely, that's something that should be there full time. Um, you often see that in GAA and I don't really like it about um, GAA is for example when, when the coaching ticket or the management ticket changes in the county it just wipes out the whole backroom team with it. And the good thing about rugby you fairly have, you have fairly set um, structures, you know, your, your, your strength conditioning team stays there, your physios and, and those fellas, and they have that understanding of the group, and they have a data from the past, and you, know, you, can, you can relate things to, um, to the previous seasons, and that's so, so important, because essentially a new person comes in, you know, there's, you know, there's a couple of months of learning there, knowing the players, personalities, environments, okay, like, you know, 
when I came from Tip to Galway, like it's essentially it's a different environment. We do the things, um, same things, but boys are different. I'm not saying the wars are bad; they're just different. Just the Galway lads are a lot better, is what you're trying to say, isn't, isn't that really? It? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, like different human beings, different way to talk to people, management team different. You know, straight away, you know, everything needs to be reworked from the scratch. There's, you know, you have certain ways to go about it, but you just need to tweak and bend certain things to go about it. So I think that. That's the step for GAA, um, and that's the challenge for them, just to provide those structures. There's a person to go to, and it's 24-7, it's full-time. And, you know, at least that's one constant. Like, I mean, it can change, something can change with it. The management setups, managers come and go, coaches come and go. But I think the structure, the broad structure, should be fairly stable there. Yeah, it, it just feels to me from the outside looking in that, as you said, if a manager changes or whatever changes, that you shouldn't be going starting from scratch again. There's a, you, I'm sure you have so much information, both personal and you know physical information built up, and from all the, the squads that you're involved with, like you shouldn't be starting. If if someone else comes in in the morning, they shouldn't be starting off trying to get all that again. You know, there has to be a bit of crossover there. Your your own love for 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 hurling then as well. Obviously, you said you 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 love kind of poking around and the guys might take make a little bit of it. But how have you? Would you describe yourself? I think that the old cliche is, are you a hurling man? I'll try. I'll say that in my best goal reaction as well as possible. Do you do you do you, do you enjoy the the sport? Obviously, like away from your work environment if there's a game on down down the road would you go watch it that sort of way i would go and watch it yeah can i consider myself hurling man no because that would be disrespectful towards the real hurling people <laughs> okay too um too short um in in the sport really i i still don't understand some of the tactics and you know guys that the, the, the lingo that goes on like uh, so no i definitely not a hurling man <laughs> I, I like the sport definitely i will watch different games and I, I slowly get an idea in terms of different hurling styles. I watched the, I watched the game on the Wexford Championship there. Then I watched Tip. And now I'm starting getting that, yeah, like they essentially there's different brands of hurling and, and the way you're playing things, but it comes slow, you know. So I'm taking my time with it. It's a slow burner, but definitely I wouldn't say I'm a hurling man. I still like to, um, I still like to watch the sport I kind of grew up on. So I, I, I was a big fan of UFC. Okay. A boxing, K1 at that time. K1 kind of... You know, it was not as popular as it used to be. K1 is a kickboxing uh, competition. But I, I've, I have a DVD from the first UFC, UFC 1. I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen bits and pieces, yeah. Yeah, I still try to keep up with those things. Watch the MMA. It, it changed a little bit. It lost a bit of, a, you know, that kind of a factor for me. But I, I still follow. I'm not a big fan of soccer. I might watch soccer, maybe Champions League or so, so, some of those things, like quarterfinal, semifinal. But hurling, I, I go and watch club game, and I enjoy it. And I enjoy to see the difference, and I, I, I slowly relate concepts into yeah, different hurling brands, but then club level, senior level, intermediate level, county level, you see those things, and now, you know, it takes time. Uh, but no, it would be offence to call myself <laughs> hurling man. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. You've 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 provided, you know, you've given so much to the sport, and like, look at the you described the homecomings there as well. Look at the the pride that you brought to hurling men and hurling women and children and everyone involved. And so, you, what you're saying really is, you're telling me it's going to be another couple of years before you become a, a full time hurling manager. Really, that is Shane O'Neill's okay for another while yet, is he? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it wouldn't be going that direction for sure, no. <laughs> I, I definitely try to harder, harder and better, better support the coaches at what they do because I think you just have to be uh, as one in terms of, you know, integrated um, strength conditioning is important. So you're integrating how can you provide best conditioning means for the guys through sport and that, that requires working for, for the whole team. So, you know, like um, I, I, I hate it at times when you see the, the, the articles about me, like almost... I'm the only person that was involved. Like you have a huge backroom team these days, and you, everyone provides vital input, like from a kit man, nutritionist, physio, myself included, and obviously managers are there taking um, all the stick and take all the glory as well. Like mm -hmm. they have to, you know, making sure that the team works well. So it essentially I'm part of a bigger picture, and not a, not a, not a, not a very big part really, you know, um, so. Very good. So you've you've won. Are you involved in your kind of your career as we kind of go through it? So it's the the RFU Women Six Nation, 
it's now the, uh, the tip all Ireland and then you you come up to a proper country uh, county and and uh, you, you join up to, to go with the best in the world you'd never guess where I'm from <laughs> would you but uh, any stage <laughs> you know, um that uh, that move up so you'd be kind of I'd say by this stage you kind of a little bit seasoned you, you saw what's going on you'd learned a lot I'm sure in terms of of all aspects of of hurling in the community and that that there is to learn really um your transition up to go within how, how was that was that a, obviously there was the Michal Donu link as well which probably helped a little you spoke about the importance of contacts uh, earlier on as well and you're right it, it's so important in, in every industry but that move up then up to Galway how was that kind of how was that period for you it was good again it was good to have a Michal as a link so he really made the transition easy and it was my decision really because as I said I like to change environment from time to time because it does it, it's a challenge and I, I won't be in Galway forever um, and my time is Galway obviously and I'll come to conclusion sooner or later but I'll definitely be looking for different challenges different projects and I'm not saying it doesn't have to be high profile county or anything like that because sometimes the lower profile counties are bigger challenges and they're, they're really Absolutely. good to show your skills and build them up to speed and, and, and provide the, the structures and environment there, build that environment or build the culture. So that's one of the things, um, that's, I suppose it's the nature of us as a, a strength condition coaches, you, you, you see loads of coaches um, travel from environment to environment. I'm fortunate enough to travel within the Ireland. So there was not a big move from Tipperary uh, to Galway because Tipperary was like 45 minute journey, Galway with the motorway, a 60 minute job really so and fortunate enough you see some coaches they you go to america to australia and, and those things so that's the nature of um of our job of our profession yeah no and i'm just from from doing a bit of research going into this and you know talking to people involved they say the biggest thing that they notice straight away with you is how you change things so much put structures in place your knowledge and even simple things like testing uh, and you know brought the whole i suppose the level of of training and quality up a couple of levels that, that is that is that something you, you when you describe the change that you kind of you enjoy that you enjoy putting your stamp on things and kind of getting shape and to obviously we've seen the success ultimately to go on and, and to be part of another all Ireland winning team but does that does that kind of challenge uh, excite you when you go in and things might you know might need a bit of work and you you have loads of you know the, the, the canvas is blank there away you go Lucas is, is that kind of a challenge as well or something you enjoy it is very enjoyable because you, you, you're building something that is your own and you're building that kind of a legacy and you know there's many ways of skin the cat really so there's you know every environment will have different approaches but definitely when you're coming in initially you assess you chat what you do how things are delivered and you're not criticizing anything like that some things are very good and you work around those things you're not going to come in and and throw everything out the window you just try to fit in you just try to tweak things and polish things up i think the approach that you're coming in when and you're putting the door in it, it's wrong but you definitely try to fit in but you try to put little supporting structures um, around the, the whole environment so it is enjoyable like in, in go away in go away things um were, i said they were different it was just a matter of tweaking a few things maybe adding a little layer here Bit of equality there maybe just revisit the basics and um, you know and basics are essentially important in training like and if you if you look at the bad athletes best athletes or best environments they do basics really well and i'd be always and my philosophy be always do simple things well and the rest is kind of icing on the cake so yeah it is it's definitely enjoyable to see that change and it's even better when the the feedback comes from players that they actually enjoy that. Oh yeah, I actually like that. I actually like that concept. I feel better um, going into training or going to the game. So yeah, it's a rewarding then as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the people that I would you know would have been chatting to whatever they, they all say that straight away. I think as a guy not to mess with it doesn't take any crap. But uh, they all speak very highly of you as well. As you can see, you're it's something oh, you're. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, maybe they're, they're just being black. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've bred not repeating some of the things. You don't take any crap. Of was the, was the, but likable was, the, was some of the, some of the, the descriptions I heard. Maybe, maybe they, they're different towards you or something like that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know. I, I don't think I'm that strict, and I hardly ever roar or shout or anything like that. It happens sometimes. Um, you just, sometimes you need to hit the reset and switch. But um, I think working with teams or, or coaching, it's, it's, it. 
it is a relationship essentially. So you know you can't really have and boss people around or 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 um or shout at people or coming in with kind of a boss attitude. You just need to have a relationship. Again, we are dealing with amateur players, and many things can go outside of a training ground, and that is important in terms of you know what is stress like at home. You know what's the story with your exams? Maybe misses can give you a hard time or those things. So those things are important. Um, to address as well because they do have a direct impact in terms of how they perform within within our training environment. So you just have to have relationship and you, know, you as I said, you're coaching human beings, so you just need to see and assess what you're dealing with. Sometimes we get it right. We're not getting right all the time, and I'm not getting right all the time. <laughs> I'm constantly learning, and every day is a lesson, really, believe it or not. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I suppose. You- the ultimate thing that goal we got right, right as a collective unit was winning Lee McCarthy that year again. Um, it, I know I'm speaking for a fan more than anybody here. Uh, it was such a relief. It had been such a long time coming. We'd had so many near misses, um, mm. so many falls down, so I remember coming out of the park so many times and you think this is it, this is it. And then some of those battles against Kikenny in the early noughties as well. And you think, God, are we ever going to win one? And then it happens and in my own personal feeling was was more it wasn't even happiness initially it was just at last it was relief i'm getting even getting goosebumps thinking back to, to that that all in fun day as well again you yeah. watch you watch the guys i'm sure you got to you know you got to hear about all those kind of false downs all of those bad moments to be involved in in that sort of a story as well where there have been such a long time coming been a first All Ireland of a generation, really, um, for many people. That again must have been hugely, hugely rewarding. Jesus, definitely was, and and it probably came a little bit quicker than what happened in Tip. So it was kind of a bit of like, oh wow, yeah, it's great, it's great to have it. Like, um, but I think many good, many good things were already in place. So it was just a matter of of, of tweaking things. Um, but. It was, yeah, I was watching around the change room after and there were some guys that were on the panel before they came to after and you could see tears in their eyes. So you, you could see what that means to some of the guys and go, well, you know, for the previous year, they were playing really, really high level as well. Very, very close. It just couldn't really um, get over. Um, but again, you know, it's just that because you, you hear those stories in Jay like, oh, geez, they don't have a belly for it, this, then the other. And I, I, I always say, like, it's bullshit. You don't really know what goes on in the... In those setups, so don't really say that. You know, it's, it's it's so so unfair on on, on these guys. And um, I actually captured the moment that when Canning was taking the sideline just before the final whistle. So that was my video as well. I kind of knew okay. we had it, and I recorded and did the eruption in the stadium as well. So that that's another one. So the the video from Tip when we, um, the homecoming and that that final moment in the game, I still have it saved and it was special as well. Like it's just everything. Uh, everyone went bananas. You could see people tears in the eyes after 29 years. It's a long time um, without a title. So it, it, it was very special. It was kind of strange as well. So like, geez, that came really fast. Um, but again, I kind of knew when I was making that step to go away that there was a massive potential there. And, and I spoke to me all before I, um, before I left Tipperary. Like, you know, you, you were watching games prior when I was, was still with Tip. Like, you know, there's obviously... Undoubtedly, there was massive potential in that particular team there. So it was coming. We just we, we were just fortunate to get things right and just get over the line. Yeah, and again, one of my abiding memories is really is that year is the semi final against your former team Tipperary. Um, mm. There'd been some absolutely epic battles over over the years. Have been so yes. kind of. It seems like it's your turn. It's my turn. That's the way they kind of went over the years. I think those. Yeah, two or three there was just like one score. And I remember having some friends over from the UK for the weekend and I ended up bringing them to that semi final. And it was their first game I heard of. Now, that semi final, for anyone that wants to refresh it back, was just one of the craziest games I've heard I've ever seen in my life. So to be someone's first game as well, I was kind of envious of them, but it's the one where Cannon scores that miracle score. I think he was halfway up the Cusick yeah. stand when he when he struck the ball into injury time there as well. But that, th- those, yeah. were, those were crazy memories. Did, do you, like, I'd be curious, like you're an outsider coming in, you're given a specific role, but 
you obviously, if this was against a team that you, you know, invested so much time and energy and all that into as well and had success with, does that, does, does those kind of paths cross? Or are you strictly, this is my team here now, or how, how much emotionally involved do you get in terms of the, the spirit of the sport as opposed to getting the players ready, if you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's probably my weak side. I sometimes be emotionally very invested. But again, as I said, I work through developing relationships and just try to give and the best tools for these fellas than to have on the pitch. So sometimes I get carried away with those things. Yeah, so it's huge. Like, I look at my uh, heart rate monitor of the game. <laughs> the heart is racing throughout the, the whole game. Like, um, definitely, yeah. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's special. And you just feel like, you know, that game was just something else. I remember as well. Like, um, it was very tight. And I knew uh, Tip will be up for, especially after really bad performance they had in, in the league final. That's right. We, we we bet them by what 15 points or something like that, and um, we had a good performance, had a bad performance. So um, even when we then we got a draw, who we playing in the semi-finals? We're like, oh yeah, I'll be <laughs> a crack. Uh, because I knew they will they they will be up for it big time. Um, and we were coming off five weeks break, so we'll have to be really on our toes to just get that sharpness in place quickly. And don't wait until they get they put um, eight or ten points head start on you, you know. Um, yeah, so it's good, but yeah, um, especially in the championship, Co Co Park is it, it's a fantastic place. It can be really great at the same time, it can be very very lonely, and you, and you feel those things. Um, but it's always for me, it's always motivation. I always want to get to the Co Park. I was very disappointed last year not to get a um, not to get to the Co Park with the senior team. I was there with minors, um, as a kind of um, observer and spectator. But yeah, I missed it a lot. So. Um, yeah, it is a little bit. I should, I suppose, I should be working to keep emotion out of it a little bit. But sometimes it's hard, you know, when you invest. Well, with a game like that as well, and all the the hours that you would, like have put, would you have put in as well through the winter, and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I, I know obviously we had a little disappointment then, and we're not going to go into it. But me all let left his position there during the winter, and but you pretty much very quickly after that were kind of signed up in a full time role as head of athletic development for 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 Galway GA the hurling side. Were you, I suppose, from a personal point of view, something like that is it must be great. I suppose everyone it's very away from sport economic wise. It's challenging times at the moment. Um, we see a lot of fitness um, industries are, are you know badly impacted. There's so many places still locked down. With lockdown, you don't really know mm -hmm. what's happening. But a little bit of personal security as well. It's and probably another step on your CV that you were able to get you know, a role like that, not just like training the team here or there for, it must be, again, something you're pr probably very proud of. Yeah, but I was proud that even look from taking different angle at it and the, from the perspective of actually providing some sort of a stability for players. Because okay. the last thing that is like someone else comes in, and I'm not saying I'm the best or anything like that, because that's definitely not true. Like, but it's the newcomer, you need to invest time to learn and learn quickly and that's a time lost in two three months when essentially you need some stability that are lost and that's not fair on boys so um and if in fairness boys stood up as well they, they want me to stay in that was their voice they want me to continue working with them so yeah i was very happy and proud and um it was special as well just to continue on but i think it was important to have some sort of a stability for a new management coming and and when Shane and the guys joined in it was probably a little bit easier for them I hope it was easier for them because I had some of the answers and I had some of the information and I was probably able to make that transition um, for them a little bit easier and so they won't be wasting so much time I mean they're fantastic guys but I was trying to as help and um, be as helpful as possible in, in the whole process because and you know then I believed that as a setup, we didn't really lose that much time. Yeah, no, and you're absolutely right because I know just, even just speaking to the guys, like it was uh, between everything that happened, the appointment was quite late in the year compared to, mm -hmm. say, other teams. And I know obviously the calendar has been absolutely mm -hmm. demolished since, but it had been a, it's an awful word to use, but it had been a normal sporting year. We didn't have the pandemic where we'd been, the All Ireland final was the last Sunday, it would have been, it would have been a, it was a saving grace, the fact that there was some sort of stability, everything was able to continue on with yourself in, in the midst of, say, chaos, for yeah. want, of, want of a better word. Um, just curious, so, so you've continued on, the, on that role and then you're involved in your, your various roles in, in, in kind of the other Galway setups. 
how is your just to uh, kind of more from my, myself just being very curious so you, obviously your a lot of your work is done is getting the prepare the players prepared to get them you know as your SEC coach what's your role then and say in the in the build up to big big spoke about big championship games say the likes of that Tipperary game or on so what's your role then on match day how do you how do you kind of work things without obviously giving too much away but what's your general general kind of kind of routine yeah it's it the match days are probably a little bit more you could there's still duties that we have to do, kind of making sure players get their activation work and, and if they're asking stuff, provide them additional stuff. Obviously, doing the warm-ups. Warm-up is a, it's a small part. But I, I always keep timing in terms of when we're going out to the pitch, how long is the warm-up, and making sure we keep the finger on the tab there. Uh, half-time, I time as well. So we have a certain, I mean, all the teams probably have that. We have a certain routine and a change room that we follow. So everything is structured. So I, I those timings and I control that. Helping um, nutrition is on the day with hydration. Anything I can do, and then obviously controlling the subs in terms of rotation, in terms of warm up, and the communicating with the management. Like, um, easy enough, and just try to provide that bit of uh, extra information as well. Chatting to players before the bigger matches as well. Maybe actually providing some distraction sometimes, um, you know, for them. Um, a bit of everything, but the main one will be, you know, your activation, your warm-ups and providing additional bits that player might want and the timing um, and then assisting a nutritionist or kit man or whatever we can do really. So we work as a unit on the match day. Timing seems to be key for, for a lot of things. I think there's an old kind of GA mindset of, you know, you run the team into the ground, you know, teach them a lesson, et cetera, et cetera. But from, again, from doing a little bit digging, that's something you're very kind of passionate about. You know when enough is enough. You, everything is so, you, stuck, you spoke about structure, uh, you, know, you know, stories of you, the, right, the management, that's it, they've enough done, that sort of way. That, that kind of side of the game. And obviously as well with your, your other, I suppose, businesses that you're involved in as well, your app, your Act, Actimate app as well as that seems to be very much in your GPC um, uh, performance uh, app as well. They seem to be that whole, I suppose we do have a tendency to, to overtrain to, to do, do too much, but you're kind of responsible from just being that kind of wise, wise not wise old man, but putting it all together and calculating out, um, you know, putting that proper structure. That's something you seem to be very, very passionate about as well. Yeah, I firmly believe that's our role as a strength conditioning coaches as well. It's, it's really work closely with coaches, with the manager, in terms of what they want and what kind of game they want to play and support them in that. But also provide them a guideline in terms of how much can we do in terms of a dose. Um, because, you know, if you let the coaches at it, they'll train, they train, train and never stop. It's not just because they're, they're, they're silly or anything like that. They just have a passion for it. And they totally understand it. And sometimes... Sometimes it's a hard thing to say, like, look, today we're only doing 50 minutes, you know, and you get those weird looks. I remember what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, I remember my first year with Eamon, and um, it was a championship week. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that's what we're doing. And we started to taper on, into the game, and that's what we're doing. Like, no, it didn't go well. Um, so, again, the selling information, how we communicate that is very, very important. But, yeah, I believe that's our job as well, to control that. You can just... And just let chaos, the chaos go and, and don't put any doors on it or any, any timing. So that's my job and just try to do that. And again, sometimes we do it right. Sometimes we get it exactly perfectly or we undercook or we overcook. Because we're dealing with, um, you know, it's, a, it's essentially a very dynamic environment. So there's loads of things going up and down and, and you know, just try to control things. And it's hard. Now, there's certain ways to go about it, obviously. We try to provide those and, and try to stick to those, but uh, you know, as you, as you know, sometimes it doesn't work out like we can't. Uh. I can imagine you, like, particularly when you're trying to, when you're breaking through into a new sport as well. And uh, I suppose the sad reality as well, your probably nationality, very, very sadly, comes into it again. What does he know about hurling or whatever? How dare me? I've been doing this all my life. But that, I suppose, it takes a bit, it takes a lot of courage in your part as well. But there must have been some clashing of heads with managers over the years as well. Like you spoke of that story. What do you mean we're only doing 50 minutes or whatever? Um, you, you've had, I'm sure you've had some interesting conversations over the years. I'll put it that way. Yeah, there were, there were clashes, there were conflicts, but it's, it's, Part of it, really, how you manage, how you solve the conflict. 
And I, again, I, I won't be bullshitting. You, sometimes you come out on the good side and sometimes you're on the bad side. Uh, but it's all lesson, uh, essentially. You try to better then deliver that message and communicate and maybe help coaches understand how certain things affect players physiologically and then how it could affect them on the, on the match day. Uh, work in progress, really, because, you know, new coaching ticket, okay, you need to go back and rewrite the script from the start in terms of how we deliver that message, what kind of tools we use to inform them in terms of what they do and how it affects our players. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a big, it's a big part because, you know, we, we could have, we, we have that essential knowledge in terms of what we have to do to increase or improve performance. But, you know, um, application of it is it's a different story. I can imagine as well with a new, uh, a new coach and, um, you know, team and stuff like that, where you mightn't have had that personal relationship built up. Um, that's a, an important selling point straight away that you get those communications bang on, because as you said, everyone will have particular ideas that they want to be teams to be super fast or super strong or play the long ball, short ball and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So I'd imagine there's a lot of kind of, a, as you said, reevaluating kind of and sitting down and, and finding that common ground really between, What's the medium perfect line and what's crazy running the guys into the ground? Yeah, look, there's time for everything. Uh, you know, I always say that to coaches, like, don't get me wrong. Like, we, we, we don't have to um, wrap the players in the bubble wrap, like, and just go tippy-tappy stuff. There's time to go hard and there's time to go worst case scenario in training. And you have to provide those things as well. And um, essentially communication goes down to, to people and the team. If you have good people and they all open to talk and, um, conversations going like you will figure it out you you'll find that middle ground and that's essentially what it was like sometimes a bit of a tug of war no i'm more important you are more important no we we are both important our 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 views and the way we want to deliver is important and essentially we want that to benefit the team that's what we try to do yeah, so I suppose I know even from my own kind of early back when I used to play a bit as well, you'd have certain managers that come in and have certain notions. And it's something I've seen you talk about recently, but it always kind of comes to line because it's always such a decisive um, conversation point or it's almost like a manager puts it in just because they want to create discipline in the group. But the old age old drinking bans, for for instance, um, I know it's something you're kind of passionate about as well. Um reveal all is there any benefit to them should the guys be you've seen professional people you know athletes after after a game they'll have a bottle or two or, or whatever um, your your background all this because it is it's I, i'm not sure if there's a more decisive kind of uh viewpoint or topic in the ga circles than the good old drinking ban yeah and i don't really understand it like you know like if you're as i said i think i said independent if you if you restrict something it probably makes things worse in terms of certain issues. And I think there is a drinking issue in terms of young population in Ireland, binge drinking and that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of GA, obviously alcohol and performance, they don't mix well. By all means, I'm not an advocate of drinking. But what I'm, what I'm really against is just create that kind of a cage or, or a jail scenario. A prison, like, you know, you've been locked up and, <laughs> and all those things that essentially allow you to, okay, just relax a little bit and and essentially the cage is open, you know, it's like you, it's a wild animal out of the cage. So um, don't like extremes. So for me, this is extreme. You know, there's need to be time for these fellas to wind down as well. And again, I'm not promoting that you have to go and drink in certain intervals. But if someone goes on um, and just can't really re relax and switch off, and I'm not saying alcohol is a way of switching off because it's not. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a funny way to create something that potentially um, make the issue even even bigger. Like, It seems to be a pretty unique GA thing as well. I'm not sure whoever had the, had the idea. No drink about until championship or, or whatever. You, you hear it all the times. Um, but you're right. It's uh, particularly when you're dealing with, you know, so many different personalities as well. And everybody has a different life environment. They may be studying or in college or they might work shift work. Or, and then in terms of relationship or living with a family on their own, they might be yeah. traveling, commuting. It seems just a bit one of the most fr frustrating things that the GA, I think at times, the old school GA mentality is kind of everything is, you know, 
this is the way it is. It's one structure for all, one size fits all, because it clearly isn't. And it wouldn't be if it was a professional thing, but particularly when it's an amateur thing and everyone has their own work and social life and, you know, a family life to, to juggle into a training routine as well. It just seems, yeah. uh, one thing for me looking in, anyways, it just seems a, a huge frustration of mine. Probably something as well that you've probably had to, not fight with, but uh, work with over the years as well, I can imagine. You know, one size for all just doesn't work. Yeah, look, it's just it's just a funny one, and it, and it's there's a big, large burden on these fellas once they have the the jersey on, you know, and like this adds another pressure onto them. Like and almost people point the finger, or oh, he was in the pub, but I haven't pined like. <laughs> yeah, particularly now with social media, it's like oh, I saw yeah. him here, he wasn't he was at X, Y, and Z. It's just yeah, it's a that's a different conversation. Social media, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, massive. Uh, that's a different story altogether. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of social media, really. I, I put up certain things on social media for the sake of having it, mainly related to uh, two projects I'm trying to run. Um, but yeah, it, I think it's getting out of control, really. You know? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very... Um, I've touched on this in previous interviews before, actually one with Tony O'Gregan, former Galway hurler, is now a professional um mind coach and does a lot of kind of the psychology involved as well um you probably would have came across them in in, in coaching circles as well but like we talked about Tony was actually there um when i was in tip oh very good oh very good very good so your, your paths are definitely crossed but we we interviewed him a week or two ago and we touched a good bit on that and the, the kind of the demands of social media and how it's how people haven't you know there's no acceptable code of conduct for want of a better word on social media and that's across this, the platform but young sports stars now as well there's a platform there for every Tom, Dick and Harry just to say any sort of waffle or any sort of abuse to them it's it's a difficult challenge as well for, for and it's so easy and, and you and you hiding essentially you know and um, it's so much easy to be a keyboard warrior and just write all those things without really knowing the, the, the context of the whole situation you know, players can be like amateur players can be affected by many things and therefore their performances can be affected so it's very easy to throw shit at them from the, from the other side through social media channels and you know it's hard like some players players literally mute all the uh, social media when it comes to the crunch time and some people can deal with it but probably the best way is just to just step out of it and not be involved in, in those things because it's just and it's unregulated as well, you know. You can you can do sort a serious harm to uh, to a person. Um, it's so easy to on these days. I could write anything, you yeah. know. That's the thing, and stuff that you wouldn't dream of say someone face to face on the street or wherever you meet them. Now it's yeah. almost the wrong word, but it's almost acceptable. Or you know, there's a, a platform there for you to to do that. It's a yeah, no. It's a, at the best of times, it's an absolutely doldrum of a, of a mm -hmm. shark fest. But when you add in I suppose sports and the passion that don't get me wrong, I get more passionate and you'll say something about a particular player. How did he miss that? Or what is he even doing? How did he get that in? But when it goes be beyond that and it's, you know, people are going out of the way to, to, to avalanche abuse. It's uh, yeah, I can imagine it is something that has to be in the, in the midst of a normal championship year where the rivalry is, is intense. It's something that has to be managed because you don't want to, you don't want some of that stuff being seen because it will affect people's performances as well. That's that's the thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, it, it might affect some people's performance, yeah. We're not all, you know, players are not robots, they're just human beings. So some of them, they can get sipped through to their subconscious and maybe could have negative uh, effect on their performance. Maybe not, for most of them not. Um, loads of players these days, and I know many counties as well, they literally go and they just sh shut down all the uh, social media, just have to provide the distraction probably the easiest option to do it you know just don't take part in it and i think i think like you anytime I'm, I'm i'm looking at conversation online in terms of the social media you just can't win you know, <laughs> always, and there's always you might have a kind of a good conversation about stuff and then some troll um shows up and <laughs> destroys everything and just, <laughs> yeah it, it you know as you said it you wouldn't have that kind of a conversation um in person you know, because loads of people, most of the people would have a balls to start throwing accusations and those things like that. So, therefore, that, that these are the places to have discussions. Like, you know, um, yeah, no, it's a... It's a stuff. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a hard... And unfortunately, we've seen it 
across various sport and not just in sporting on all aspects of life and it's even yeah. it's it's gone beyond abuse as well you see some horrible racist uh, comments or, and stuff like that it's it's definitely something as a society it's not a sporting issue it's a, i think it's more of a society we're not we're we're not used to it i think we'll need another, gener another generation or you know strict platforms in place whether that's an id system that you have to you know be screened before you go and you can't just have a face as a counter you have to become ex acceptable yeah. too um, yeah some sort of regulation definitely needed because if as you said it keeps going getting worse and worse it's easier and easier actually to throw rubbish at people yeah sure what does that polish hurling um, strength and condition coach what, what would he know he doesn't even know <laughs> doesn't even know what to do i want to i want to touch on you you mentioned there as well your, your two projects that you're you're working alongside as well and i know i've heard some rave reviews. I know you had a web, webinar as well there during the week as well. So you're doing great work there. So your, your two ones, do you want to have a, I suppose, explain to explain to everybody uh, what, what they are and what are the other projects you're, you're involved with, uh, GPS, uh, Performance and Actimet as well. They're the, the two major ones, is that correct? Yeah, they're a major project. So Actimet is a, is a training load wellness reporting app a player management system um, and GPC is a platform, online platform for um, for coaching programs. Basically, where we when we kind of a bridging gap between giving you just PDF with the program and um, um, or being one on one, we kind of sit somewhere in between. So we have interactive platform where you get all the coaching, all the videos, and and that kind of stuff, and and tailor made programs um, towards your sport or towards your goal. Um, Actimate is a, it's it's a good one, really. Um, that's something I've been involved. That's something I obviously came initially when I was actually working with with rugby um, underage in Munster under 18s. We're collecting all the subjective information. So basically, how players are finding training, uh, what are the wellness scores, how they're reacting to the trainings put up to them, and it was a really tedious job. Um, try to collect that information, put it in Excel, then make some um, action and decisions based on that information. It's all you know, time consuming, you're losing hours, loads of hours monthly. So then that progressed into some sort of a kind of a Google Doc system when um, we're capturing information through um, Google Sheets and, and those things. And eventually I tried to build the app. And to be honest, um, it wasn't really easy. Initially, I tried it in Poland, it was a dead end. And then I went with the app to India, found a company that you know they were telling me they can do this, that, and the other. And it was a uh, and it was a big fail as well. So lost time and money um, in the process. And eventually, uh, through Rory, Warren, um, found a good, experienced um, developer. And we just sat down and we got the project going. So we are where we are with now. We have over 150 teams on it. And we're slowly getting out there. It's a nice, little, efficient way to collect that information through coaches. And what, the way we try to build that system is we just try to make sure, first of all, athletes can... Uh, input that information very easily, fast, and um, so no no big questionnaires, um, no kind of sub menus, one two clicks, and off to the coach. And then for coaches, um, we just try to make system that is you know you can access that system and get the information from it without having a sports science degree. So very very efficient, um, in, in 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 almost streamlining the process of capturing that important information. And wellness information these days is important because it can tell you if players under stress or how they're responding to, to training, to the physical training, what goes on outside of the training ground. And we have an um, important section in our app that players can provide comment and comments are very, very powerful things to have, you know, what players think. And you know, the thing with GA sometimes uh, people would don't say face to face, it's easier. Again, it goes back to keyboard warrior. It's easier actually to write something in terms of a criticism. I take criticism every day because um, I think it makes me better as a coach. Um, so that's what it is in, in a nutshell. Very simple way to capture that information, efficient, and make it accessible for not only sports science or strength condition coaches, but for, for your managers, for hurling coaches. Um, and we try to encourage that communication through that system. Yeah, and and I, I, I suppose given the the current environment of the even the last couple of months as well with lockdown and everybody having to be away from groups and you know do training individually as well, two platforms that have become even more important as uh, as that communication tool and as that 
tracker in terms of you know programs and then tr tracking everything then as well very yeah like the gpc very handy because i said it's interactive and it's easier to distribute the programs to players um and i've over what, 130 players under my watch now, so it's it, it would be hard to send individual um, PDF programs to 130 people. We kind of work in the main teams in the groups, and we have different variations of the program. Then they can have the menus and, and the options, and that way it's much much easier to manage that. Um, and essentially, they will look at the struggle. Normally, in the past, it'll be you send the PDF. They ask like, "What's what's that exercise? What is it? How do oh. I do that one again?" Now they come back and like literally clean the exercise. He shows them the coaching cues, the, the coaching points, um, and also provides the video. So it's much easier for them to relate back. Oh yeah, that's the one we were doing. That's what we want to do. Um, and it's nice, secure way as well. You know, there's everything stays within the system. And then we feed back the information through through Actimate. So for us um, as a group, it's been great help really for me as well because normally it'll probably. It, it, it was busy throughout the lockdown to provide different players with different programs and just keep them interested. Um, it was hard and challenging as it is, but the platform was great help. And we use that with individual athletes from different codes and different sports as well. We have a variety of clients. We have, we have boxers, we have track and field people, um, we have rugby guys, we have mogi, we have hockey. So we have, we have a nice um, variety of sports um, within our clients. And, and the system, it's, it's a nice way, nice solution if you want to work with us. Um, but, you know, you, you're based in Northern Ireland or you're based in Dublin or something. Um, it's not perfect. Ideal scenario will be work one-on-one -on -one and have that presence of the coach. That's, that's a gold standard. But if we constrain certain things, it's just a nice um, solution. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and again, from people that are using it, um, rave reviews as well have made their life so much easier. And the, the fact that I think it's very useful as well is that you're able to monitor. So you can tell, oh, oh hold on there, you go, you're going too much. Or, you know, there's that. It's not just a, a complete like online kind of video or whatever. And that's it. There is, a, I suppose, a management and a, a coaching role, for want of a better word, involved as well. It is. It's very interactive and provides that feedback and um if, if they do exercise technique and they can upload it, literally jumps in be, be beside their, their exercise, there's obviously communication channel through, through messaging. Um, and they can log in what they're lifting on both platforms, actually. Actimate is beautiful that way because, you know, it's a subjective data, but it's a, it's a definitely conversation striker um, in, in some cases. You know, subjective data is basically what, feel, what, what is a player perception or you know, certain things. So you just have to take a bit of a, distance with those things but as a conversation is good okay you come to phone what's going on what's going what's going on where, why is why is stress um level so high um for that particular uh, login ah, a bit of this at work at college maybe or something like that you just make a little amendments to the programs and modification and that's that's the way we kind of operate you know absolutely uh, very useful and so for any kind of teams or, or anybody that's interested in easier either of those platforms what's the best way to to suppose get in touch or, or start that conversation with you guys the best way is to visit both of our websites so actimed.com gpcperformance.com for, for, for our programs and um, we have um on actimed.com we have a two-week trial so you can you can jump in you can register as a coach you can bring your athletes onto that team see what platforms can do for you can can it make your life easier can really contribute and i'm sure it can um but all those things these are just another tools in the toolbox so you have to use them the athlete monitoring or those subjective monitoring is a thing that you know you need to build the habit among your athletes login that they provide your information initially you might chase them a little bit um for that for maybe 30 to 60 days until you develop that habit um but once it's there you know, it will provide the benefit. We have, a, we have a nice academy in Poland that they signed up seven teams with us. And they actually did something that we don't really recommend for underage teams because I think the that reporting um, activity is for guys that maybe are 15 plus. But they actually, they approached um, under 13s. And they have teams of under 13s actually reporting wellness scores and they have really good um, compliance on those things. So. Obviously, it's down to coaches instead of coaches and what kind of philosophy and what kind of environment they try to build. They have seven teams um, and they, 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 the youngers are uh, under 13 and they're, they're getting the full use of, it, of the system. So, um, nice story. 
Absolutely, and we'll put the links, and um, we'll sh um, share them out underneath as well, so people do want do want to get in touch, um, because I know from again from speaking to the, some of the guys are using it, nothing but good words, and how easy it's made their, their life. And you, as going back to what we discussed on our, earlier on as well, in terms of communication and passing data to managers and uh, other members of the coaching team as well, it, it's such a it's such a unique and such an easy way of just processing that all to, all together because uh, information is key and all that, particularly in these times. It is, yeah, especially in the current situation where you don't see the players for a long time. It's good, good, to have the, good to have that info, have some sort of info in terms of, right, that's what he's doing throughout the week and that's how he's experiencing it. Uh, so it definitely helps. And this is an extra layer of information we need. Like coaches will go to the games, obviously, they will watch their um, players' performances, but this just kind of provides that additional information, their background in terms of how that information or situation might affect them. Um, so it definitely is. And it's easy and it's fast. Um, and it's understandable for coaches. And again, you know, like we, our competition there, they're probably system to have more features, but a lot of it actually is complicated. Um, and your typical sports coach or hurling coach goes into it and it just gets lost. In our system, you, you'll find your way around pretty easily. Very good, very good. As I said, we'll, we'll share the, the links out there um, and uh, hopefully if anybody's interested, they can get in touch with Lucas and his uh, business colleagues as well. So um, yeah, no, Lucas, listen, thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed that there. I got to see a bit more behind the the, uh, the, the big era that, that, that is there. And um, hopefully we don't really know what's going to happen um, in terms of the sporting field for, for the rest of the year. Hopefully we'll have a Christmas Lee McCarthy celebration. That'd be a good video to have as well, wouldn't it? <laughs> with the snow <laughs> with the snow there we go it's almost like from the movies <laughs> yeah let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> <laughs> there we go uh, and and definitely no definitely no drink of bands around christmas that's all we'll say then as well <laughs> <laughs> lucas thank you so much uh, it's been an absolute pleasure as i repeat we'll put the links out uh, to both of those uh, projects as well so and you can get in touch with lucas thank you so much and uh, we'll talk to you again soon thanks, John. thanks for having me thank you all the best